Hi, welcome to History Revision Podcast on the foreign policy in Britain, 1964 to 79. Let's start off with decolonisation. In 1964, 18 new independent ex-colonies were in the Commonwealth, but we still had military responsibilities east of Suez from obligations such as the Baghdad Pact and SEATO. If you know what they are, look them up. Public and government opinion still believed we had an important role to play in the world. And there were problems in this period in Nigeria and South Africa in the 60s. The Commonwealth, however, was not increasing Britain's world influence. The main problem came, though, in Rhodesia. This was the exception to peaceful transition in our decolonisation. Macmillan's Wind of Change speech was seen in most of Africa as a force for good, but in the South, it was seen as a challenge and a threat. This is because these countries had the most white settlers. In 1961, South Africa had left the Commonwealth and moved further towards apartheid. In 1963, the Federation of Nyasaland and Rhodesia split up. Northern Rhodesia became Zambia, Nyasaland became Malawi, and they were both independent states. But Southern Rhodesia wasn't allowed to because of their rejection of black majority rule. And the Commonwealth put pressure on Britain um, to stop them from becoming independent, and they were very strong on this. Ian Smith took over Southern Rhodesia in 1965 and pushed them into UDI, Unilateral Declaration of Independence. This was a challenge to Wilson's government, although it wasn't Wilson's top priority. Wilson and Smith met on HMS Tiger off Gibraltar and made progress until Smith disavowed everything he said when he got home. We put in oil embargoes and an embargo on tobacco, but the oil sanctions weren't working really due to smuggling in through Mozambique and big oil companies ignoring the sanctions. They met again on another warship but Wilson had made it obvious that he wouldn't use military sanctions and Smith was emboldened by this and also from support from right-wing conservatives like the Monday Club. The white Rhodesians had fought for Britain in World War II and a lot of British people were unwilling to use arms or even sanctions against them. Diplomacy was failing. South Africa was also offering Rhodesia support, which didn't help, and when Heath took over and continued the ineffectual sanctions, he sent Hume for unofficial talks, but that didn't work, and the issue stagnated. Then in the early 70s, a guerrilla war started out in the bush, with black Marxists, including Robert Mugabe, um, fighting against the white settlers, and suddenly South Africa stopped giving support. The independence from nearby Portuguese territories, Angola and Mozambique, had eventually brought the majority rule into uh, southern Rhodesia, and that's what caused the change in heart of South Africa. Smith signed the Kissinger Plan, which was made up by the USA, UK and South Africa, and that promised black majority rule within two years, in 1976. By 1979, multiracial elections had been helped and the country was renamed Zimbabwe Rhodesia. Overall Smith had made the UK governments look ineffective and weak but the real problem was his as what happened to his country later when Mugabe took over well his history and well known history at that. It also proved the Commonwealth had shaped British foreign policy. Meanwhile Britain had to make military cuts and they had to deal with the bases east of Suez. The Labour government knew in 1964 that we needed to reduce military commitments and that had been a manifesto promise in the 1964 election. In office though, little change was initially made. In 1966, a defence review said that the overstretch of British forces was unjustifiable and Healy, as the newly formed Minister of Defence, had to reduce military spending to below £2 billion by 1970. In 1967, Healy set a timetable for military withdrawal from Aden, from the Middle East, from Malaya and Singapore, and that was at the protest of the host governments who lost both protection and the income the British troops provided. The USA also protested at this because of the threat of spreading communism in these places, and they also had to step in in the Middle East. Britain didn't want to play world policemen after Suez in a time of financial strain. However, a nuclear deterrent was to be upgraded at a large cost in 1967 in the commitment. This meant that we still could claim to be a world power. After devaluation in 1967, Jenkins 
and his Kurtz meant withdrawal from East of Suez was speeded up quickly. Many new military constructions and buying the F-111 warplane was abandoned. The Navy lost most as its role was mostly an Imperial presence and that was going. And the Conservatives criticised these cuts and promised to reverse them, especially in the Gulf States, in 1970 um, and in their manifesto in the 1970 election. Partly though this was just to distinguish Conservatives from Labour on foreign policy and when Heath came to power he didn't reverse them with one or two exceptions, for example a presence in Malaya. Heath was reluctant to withdraw from the Middle East because of oil but eventually decided not to reverse the decision and by the end of the 70s pretty much all the bases had been discontinued east of Suez. The 1974 Defence Spend Review wanted to reduce the military spending to 4.4% of GDP by 1985 compared with in 1964 it was 8% of GDP. This clashed with Labour's policy for nuclear deterrent and Labour agreed to update Polaris and accepted cruise missiles in the UK in secret. Callaghan also froze manpower cuts in 1979 in the wake of Soviet-USA disarmament talks which could have been a threat to our own security. 